right, you guys, we are back. It is Behind the Bikini, and we are on episode 31. What is up, you guys? This is like a lot in a week because we've got schedules coming up for show travel, so we decided to do this ahead of time so we wouldn't miss out on a week. You know, that's what we have to do once we get into the season. So with that, the topic this week is going to be about getting into the season, which is self-sabotage. Um, I'm sure some of you out there listening have done this yourself. I know I have. I know I've, I've been guilty of this. And it's a it's a serious situation. Uh, we'll go into it a little bit more. But before we do all that, like, subscribe, comment, all of the fun things, as we always say, that helps us with our algorithms. You guys have been doing great as far as leaving comments and questions and stuff like that. We do read everything, so don't stop. Um, we, we'll, we'll go back. We even got some questions here that I pulled from like six weeks ago that were put onto the, the uh, topic back then that we're going to put in as questions this week. So uh, before we get into all that, how are you doing? How's your weekend going? Good. How about you? Um, good. I'm, <laughs> I'm a little puffy today, but that's okay. Um, it was my husband's birthday this weekend. So, um, I baked for him. Like my husband's thing is, you know, as I always say that the fastest way to a man's heart is through his stomach. So, you know, his, his thing is food. And, uh, like I just made all of his favorites and baked carrot cake for him because that's his favorite thing. I'm actually, oh, that's awesome. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a master baker. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah, that cake you made looked like professional. It's uh well, so long story short, back when I was in high school and I was trying to decide what I wanted to do going into college, I was gonna either go to school for music, which is what I did do, or I was gonna go to school for culinary arts. So oh, wow. I wanted to become a pastry chef. Um, I still love baking. I just don't do it very often because I'd be 500 pounds if I did. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it's one of those things. Um, I love doing it though. And when I do it, it's like the full fat, full rich, full sugar, full everything. Like I don't skimp on any of that stuff. So it is not healthy at all. It's the only way to do it. Um, I started baking a little bit more this past year and Dan was eating all of it. And he's like, you can't do that anymore. Cause I'm going to be fat and I'm going to get diabetes. And I was like, okay, got it. But he wouldn't, he wouldn't let me like give it away either. I was like, I can go give it to like the neighbor kids or something. He's like, no, you can't give this stuff away. It's too good to give away. I was like, so I guess I just can't bake then. <laughs> so that's just where it is. That's gotcha. It is. <laughs> gotcha. But yeah, I have a lot so, of clients that like to bake when they're in prep. I'm like, wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's uh, tempting. <laughs> I know. I, I don't particularly like to do it when I'm a prep. I just like to do it in general. Um, but again, I, I, I don't eat all of it. Like I had, I had carrot cake yesterday that I made. And it was really good. I ain't gonna lie. It was really good, but I also, I'm lactose intolerant. So that's why today I feel like poop because you know, cheese, cream cheese and dairy and all that kind of stuff. Not, not good for my, my digestive tract right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it is what it is. Do you have anything fun, like little hobbies like that, that you like to do? No, I'm pretty boring. Yeah, I'm a workaholic. <laughs> you, well, you like to go go to the gun range. Yeah, that is a new hobby of mine. I've been shooting yeah. a lot with uh, Greg, Jamie's husband, and Drew's getting into it now. So, yeah, that's actually something we've been talking about is, like, I've never had anything that, you know, th the thought of um, retiring one day from competing is scary because I'm going to be like, oh, what do I do then, you know? Um. So. Um, competitive shooting is very interesting to me and it's something that I might do when I'm not, com uh, guys, don't worry. I'm not, I'm not retiring anytime soon, but <laughs> just looking ahead, that's, it is yeah. something I, I probably would like to do is maybe some competitive shooting or something like that. Just a whole nother different, you know, experience and something that I am starting literally from the ground up with and I love a challenge. Yeah. So it's cool. It's cool to have something else and we call it ballistic therapy. I mean, it is very right. like centering and you have to be very focused on your breath and you can't. Yes. You know, it's almost like posing with bodybuilding too. Like you can't hold the gun so like hard and it's been very interesting. So yeah, I guess I do have a hobby shooting. There you go. <laughs> Has this just been like recent since you moved to Arizona or have you done it before? Oh yeah. Like I never had experience like with guns or I, I'm, I'm actually was a little afraid of guns. And yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. We did, we've obviously done indoor shooting. Um, and then a few weeks ago we did the outside uh, skeet shooting. So oh, okay. I was real, I was actually pretty good at that. And I was surprised nice. yeah, because I'm actually better with a moving target than a still target. So really, yeah. so that's when I haven't done. So I, I grew up around guns. I grew up on a farm. So, you know, my, my uncle was into competitive hunting. So, okay. um, like when I, I, I was into archery, I did all the, all the shooting. So when I, I shot my first deer when I was 16 in his backyard, that kind of thing. Wow. So, yeah, but I've never done the, the skeet shooting thing. I've never done that. 
but yeah, I was cool. actually really good at archery, believe it or not. So, and you're right. Ooh. It's a very like, like centered, like you have to be very focused. It's very light touch. It's not a grip pull. Yep. pull. That's not yep. what it is, you know? Yep. So you have to be very, very centered on everything. It's a, it's a focus thing. I do. I Less do. Is more. Mm-hmm, I do. Yeah. So, and my husband is completely the opposite of me when it comes to that kind of stuff. So like we went, got, we went shooting at a gun range during like right after the COVID situation. So we started looking at getting, you know, a handgun for the house, all that kind of fun stuff. And, um, he was terrible at it. <laughs> he was like, he was like, for the first couple times we went, he just watched me do it. Cause he was scared of the guns. He's never touched a gun in his life. Exactly. I was like, yeah, it's like, I was like, it's really not that scary once you get into it. Like you, you it's actually a good thing to be educated on it. You know what I exactly. mean? Exactly. Yeah. And, it's uh, like that part of the, the, um, the, the growth of it is getting over that fear. Like, yeah. you know, and it was very interesting too. We did the concealed class and they were talking about like the legality behind it and like where people get into trouble. And most of the time, even if you're defending yourself, you're, you're getting in trouble for yeah. a firing, you know, you have such a responsibility with a firearm. So it's just, it's really interesting to like also hear like that side of it. Um, so yeah, thanks for thanks for reminding me about that. Yeah, you, you have a hobby. That's my new hobby. I have a hobby. I, have a I love hobby. it. I love it. I love it. No, it's 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 you know it is it's, and it 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 speaks to kind of like what you said. What we do here too. It's very cl- controlled and very methodical and very like it just it it ties in perfectly with the posing, like you said. You know what I mean? Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> very sim- very similar thought processes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, let's see. You can't keep constantly reminding me that I'm going into prep soon. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. So that's funny. I literally just got off the phone with you a few minutes ago. So um, I, we were supposed to start prep next week, but I called her this morning because I was like, you know, I, I'm leaving for on Thursday to go to Clash for the weekend yeah. and mm-hmm. I check in on Fridays. And I was like, you know, I really don't want to be in the middle of Orlando getting your response back on how we're starting prep when I'm in yeah. Indeed that whole weekend. It's it's not about me on Friday. It's about the right. athletes. So I was like, can we start prep today just so I have like at least a four, you know, four days at home yeah. to start getting my meal plan together and start, you know, slowly, you know, getting into routine and things like that. She was like, oh, yeah, like that makes perfect sense. So she's building my uh, new plan now. So we're actually starting prep today. Oh, um, wow. Okay. Yeah. So here we go. Um, nice. I have a lot of time. So people in the back of their minds are going to be like, okay, like, you know, I'm not coming out till, till Olympia or closer to the Olympia. So it is a lot of time, but my body usually takes about 20 20 to 24 weeks to really be ready. Um, so I just want to start now and kind of get aggressive and then also be able to have like structured beef feeds and things like that. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're yeah. just going to take, take our time. Yeah. And on my end, like I was, you were the first one to remind me that my prep's going to be coming up soon. And then I checked in with our last, our last podcast, I checked in that day and in Jamie's response, she's like, yeah, you can have your free meal again. This is working really well for us, blah, blah, blah. She's like, but you know, just keep it structured like we typically do because we're going to be tightening it up soon. And I'm like, damn it. Y'all keep reminding me. <laughs> like both of you guys keep reminding me that prep's coming. Ah, but no, I'm, I'm excited for it because I know that I've got some good, you know, some good tissue added and all that kind of stuff too. And I feel like my body's responding really well. Like I, I, I'm, I put this in my post. So since Drew changed my training, I'm down almost four, four full pounds since that time frame. In the last two weeks, I'm down three. So it's like, um, my body's responding well and I can see the changes and all that kind of stuff too. And I just see, see the areas filling out that are supposed to be filling out. So it's, it's, it's exciting to see that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So it's one of those things that's like, I enjoy where I'm at right now, but I'm also excited to see what I've been able to improve as I but, peel back yeah. down again, you know? So it's, it's that I'm in that spot right now. <laughs> yeah. It's bittersweet. You know, we've talked yeah. about that on the podcast about, you know, when your body's growing and like you're seeing those, that, that growth and that density being added and you know, a cut's coming. It's almost mm-hmm. like, oh, do I want to pull back now? Like yeah. my body's like locked in, you know, but you yeah. know, with your timeline and how much you you've improved, you know, yeah. it might a good time just to try to get on stage so it's hard it's it's so hard yeah. to, to balance those decisions it is me it was you know it's always about taking that mental break and like by the time I start prep like I want to be chomping at the bit like I want to want to suffer and yeah. that's where I'm at right now so it's good my off season was good that means my mental's in a good spot physical's in a good spot so I'm ready you know and yeah. stress is low and things like that but if I wasn't really ready if I was kind of questioning prep blah 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 I know for me like I can't give a hundred myself to a prep unless I know that I'm mentally there. So yeah. Well, I'm going to do my blood work again on Tuesday. 
fun. So, me too. I literally was just trying to schedule that before uh, so we got on this call. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, little things like, you know, when we did that coaches weekend, I didn't realize some things like about like not to train right before you do your, your blood work and that you really shouldn't have coffee right before your blood work and all that kind of stuff. So like I try to schedule everything out this week. So I'm not training on Monday. I always train on Mondays, but I'm like, I'm not going to train on Monday. and I'm going to do my blood work first thing Tuesday so that I have, you know, that rest in there. So that it's really a better, truer a sense of what my, my actual blood work is supposed to be and all of that. So I'm kind of excited about it because I've never done it that way. So hopefully this will be more of a true value. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Just keep that in mind when, you know, with your recent labs, if you've, you know, trained the day yeah. before, blah, 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 you, it can't, it's not really a comparison at that point. Correct. It's to be a different, yep. you know, spot. So this is yep. kind of like your first one and then you'll mm-hmm. kind of come here from there. But yes, at the time of labs, you should be fasted with water yep. only and no yep. training before because training breaks down muscle tissue and mm-hmm. that creates enzymes in your body that are flagged on your lab work, like high yep. kidney filtration and liver and things like that. So those things are going to come back flagged. And are they flagged because you trained the day before yes. or because they're actually flagged? So that's why right. it's really important to make sure that you're doing certain things around your lab work. <laughs> yep. And again, I didn't know that until, you know, Joanna was talking about it at the, at the coaches weekend. And I was like, oh, I was mm-hmm. like, well, guess I got to get my lab labs redone. <laughs> got it. And even my husband, he was like, no, he's like, you can have coffee. I was like, no, she told me not to have coffee. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to have coffee. It is what it is. Yeah. I'll, I'll suffer for a couple hours. I'll bring it with me and I'll be ready as soon as I get my blood drawn. <laughs> There's Jamie calling me right now. Here's oh gosh. <laughs> Do you want to take a second? No, I'll just text her and tell her around. Okay. Podcast. Okay. <laughs> Cause you're starting prep. Yeah. Mom, Mama Bear's on it. Mama Bear's She's on ready. It. <laughs> she, she is ready. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so lab work, and it, and it does make a big difference. Like sometimes I get clients that, you know, their labs come back and their liver enzymes or kidney enzymes are through the roof. And I'm like, uh, okay, so we get on a call. I'm like, hey, what'd you do yesterday? Oh, I did train legs and blah, blah, blah. So we send them back in, they go get them redone, and it comes back completely different, normal yep. or slightly elevated. You know, some elevation within athletes is normal, but not these typical numbers that we see right. if someone did train the day before. So yes, it yep. is very important. Or alcohol. Alcohol will make a difference too. Oh yeah. I mean, obviously mm-hmm. like the day before your labs, like be mindful what you're putting into your body <laughs> and when for sure. I know. Well, that's why I was like, that's why I was like yesterday we celebrated Dan's birthday and that's why I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm done now because I have to be normal through till Tuesday. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. just what it is. So yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it's, Ooh, it's, it's suffering to be normal, you know, but, absolutely. uh, (laughs) but yeah, it's, um, it's exciting at the same time too. You know what I mean? Like it's, 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 I enjoy seeing stuff like that. I enjoy kind of analyzing all that kind of stuff and just seeing improvements or not, you know, I'm, I'm obviously when you, if you look at any of the posts that I put up on stuff, I'm I'm very detail oriented when it comes to what am I looking at? And I do that every week. Like the last post that I put up about the the training split and all that stuff. I literally do that with my photos every week. I go back and I look at a a set point from, from some point, you know, whenever I was trying to to compare it. And I do that every single week. Um, The only way that you can know if you're progressing is if you're analyzing those details. I mean, otherwise you're, you're, you just don't know. You just don't know. It's such a slow progress kind of sport. People are expect things to happen like that, like within a month. And it just doesn't work like that. It just doesn't work like that. You know, you're going to see some initial changes when you first start a new program or something like that. But over time, it is a very slow process. It's very methodical and you have to pay attention to all those little details. Yeah, I think that's a good segue into actually what we're talking about today, which is Mm -hmm. Ed um, and the mental mindset, you know, especially self-sabotage, the closer you get to show, you know, and um, there is such a thing if you guys have ever heard the term of prep goggles, which means, you know, when you are that lean and you're pushing that hard, you know, week to week, it's really hard to see the changes for yourself. Um, and, you know, as a coach, when I'm coaching someone, I'm looking at all of those details for my athletes. I'm pulling up their photos from last week and comparing. I'm pulling up their photos from four weeks and comparing. And I'm trying yes. to see where we're behind or where we're ahead and how the body's responding. And as your own athlete, it's or as your own person, as an athlete, it's very hard for you to do that self-assessment on yourself. I could do the same exact assessment for myself with my photos, but I see myself in a different light and I'm not seeing those same changes. And sometimes that could be very frustrating and also discouraging. But Jamie can do the same assessment of my photos in the same time frame and things like that and see all of these different changes. So that's why it's important to 
lean on your coach. And, right. you know, if the coach says, hey, we're, we're good, we're ahead, we're on track, whatever, you have to trust that. Um, and if they say that we're behind, then you have to go, okay, well, what, what do we need to do to get on track? Like, yeah. where, am I, where am I lacking? Blah, blah, blah. So the self-sabotage kind of starts starts with this thought. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times, too, if you, it's almost worse when you've been in this for a long period of time because when you're first starting out, you don't know what you don't know. So you just trust blindly for yeah. better or for worse. You trust blindly. Um, but the more that you get into this, the more you start analyzing yourself against other people and against against standards and things like that. And like I was just talking to one of my girls the other day and she sent me her, her photos and stuff. She's like, I just feel too big. I was like, well, your your feedback from last year was that you were too conditioned. So you need to be bigger this year. I mean, that's that's what you have to do. And I understand that for you, this doesn't make sense because you're not used to looking like this. I'm like, but this is what your feedback was. So you, you have to pay attention to stuff. When I say one of my girls, one of my posing clients, um, you know, so she, you, at the end of the day too, it's like, that's something you gotta be careful about too, is getting too many op opinions and too much noise, you know, because yeah, I'm gonna sit there and I can tell you the truth too, but I'm probably gonna agree with your coach because I see it like your coach does usually. <laughs> So, you know, I, it just, it's just is what it is. I don't know. I, and that's the other thing too. If, you're, if I'm not your coach and I'm not doing your training, your diet, and all that kind of stuff, I don't know the inner workings of it. So there may be one or two pieces that I'm not really on board with because that's just not my style, but I don't know all that background stuff. Your coach does. And if you're generally going in the right direction, I'm probably going to say, you know, your, your coach is right. You know what I mean? So sometimes getting multiple opinions from multiple people will also make you question more right here. Oh, and it'll I, make, yeah. Yeah. It'll make, it'll make you do the self-sabotage. Yeah. Go ahead, I mean, what there's too many cooks in the kitchen, you know, yeah. and we always mm -hmm. say there's, there's 10 ways to skin a cat as long as the cat gets skinned. If you keep getting opinions from different resources, they're going to tell you different ways to get to the same result. And it makes that's you right. question if one way is the right way or not. So yeah. that's where you have to go back to, you interviewed your coach and we've talked about how to do that and finding the confidence in that, making sure that you're picking the right person. And no matter what that plan is, you have to be able to execute it. You're going to see things online that are different than what you're doing. It doesn't mean that what you and your coach doing is not the right way. That's right. Um, I think that people get into self-sabotage uh, cycle. Really the top reason is, is the comparison game. You know, whether they're comparing um, a check-in photo that they see online with a certain athlete, or they're seeing what a certain athlete is doing in terms of cardio or food or an approach and nothing is right or wrong. You know, you have to remember too, at the end of the day that you don't know what that athlete is doing really behind the scenes. You don't know if That's there's right. people, you don't know if they're following their plan or not following their plan. That could be overeating and under eating. They could be going too hard or not doing enough. Like whatever people per put on social media is their best foot forward. Right. And so it's really important to get off your phone if you notice that it's, you know, starting to affect you mentally. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do not think that you should be looking at other athletes or searching for other athletes in a show. When I was an amateur, I did that myself the first two years of competing. And I'll tell you this, anyone that I thought I was worried about did not look like they did on social media. Yeah or they just were not a threat at all. I was beating them in some sort of way. And I say that in the most humble way to say like, people are again, are posing their best and putting it on social. So that they're, they, they might not look like that. So why right. are we gonna stress ourselves out about someone that's coming? Focus on yourself and bringing your best. Cause at the end of yep. the day, does, that's all you can do. Even if someone's showing up better than you, you can yep. only just show up your best. Yep. And it doesn't matter. And again, it doesn't matter what they're putting on state or on, on social media because what matters is what they put on stage. And as we've seen at plenty of shows, that can change you even from prejudging to finals, what you look like up there. You know, we took good examples. We talked about, you know, Phoebe being five foot nine and the majority of the competitors all being five foot five or five foot four that she's standing next to when she's on stage. You know, whenever, whenever we're reviewing these last couple of shows. She looks completely different because of her height. When she's by herself, she looks great. And then you got to, but you got to remember that it's done when she's standing next to these girls that are half her size. You know what I mean? So just following them on, on social media doesn't help you at all. And right. it's, if anything, it's just going to hurt you again right here. And this is the most powerful part of being in this game. The most powerful part.
Yeah. I mean, at the, at the, like we talked about this last week with the macros and things like that, you know, just taking little extra bites of peanut butter and all that kind of stuff, not weighing your medium banana, which now fucking bananas are coming up in my feed all the time. I'm like, what the hell? Bananas are everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> I'm just like, these are medium bananas everywhere you look. <laughs> um, so, but those little things, those, <laughs> those are ways of self-sabotage. Those are ways yeah. of of saying, oh, you know, well, I don't really need to worry about this little bite, you know, because I just need to be a little bit fuller. Or, you know, those are the things that you're telling yourself in your brain. And this is going to actually help me if I do this. It's going to actually help me if I do a re- if I do a refeed because, look, she did a refeed. It helped her. I need one of those because I feel dis- I feel like crap, so I definitely need a refeed. So this is just going to help me. You know, things yeah. like that. Those are things you tell yourself. Yeah, I've been there before too. Like I. You, you just get so hungry at some points where you're like, this 30 extra grams of banana isn't going to yeah. do anything. I deserve this. I'm pushing yes. hard. I'm training legs today. And it's yeah. like, no, a part of the discipline is doing, making the right choice on the hard days, yes. right? Like the, the, the times that you feel the worst is where you really have to push through. And that's really where you start to see the changes in the body. Yeah. Um, Something that we were talking about yesterday when we were coming up with our topic for today was you coined the term the five week freak out. Mm -hmm. And that's where people start kind of getting in their head. They're getting close to show. They're getting a little bit more emotional. Things are riding high, which is also interesting that you call it the five week freak out. And what I always notice is that the six weeks to five, you know, five weeks um, Mm -hmm. out from show is when the changes in the body are daily at that point. I mean, you're pushing so hard. You're theoretically on the lowest amount of food at this point. Like, so you're seeing those daily changes within your body, which is so interesting because that's also when the mental starts to freak out. So if you could keep this here, good. Mm -hmm. And then just kind of ride your plan, knowing that you're in the thick of it. Yep. You're going to, two weeks from now, you're going to be like, wow, I look great. But you have to keep this in the right spot. And listen, guys, this is easier said than done. You guys know my mental is my, my kryptonite. Like Mm -hmm. that, that has been my limiting factor. So I realize it's easier said than done, but that's where, again, you have to really go back and rely on your coach on that five week freak out and go, I'm not good. I'm questioning everything. Please tell me what I need to hear to know that we're okay. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so funny because when you mentioned that yesterday, uh, this is, and I've only been a coach for a short period of time. I've been a posing coach for a very long time. And this is the time frame where every one of my posing clients will reach out to me and be like, I'm not going to be ready in time, or I'm dropping weight too fast, or I'm not dropping dropping enough weight, or I'm not lean enough, or I'm not conditioned enough, whatever it is. It is, I I was like, I would always be like, so when's your show? It's in five weeks, right? Like every time it's the five week out freak out every time it's that time frame. Like you said, this is when your body is making the most noticeable changes, but you also mentally are like, okay, I have, I have over a month to get there. I have over a month to get to the show. So it's a lot of time to make changes, but I only have a month left to go. And so there's not enough time to make changes. You know, your brain constantly ping pongs back and forth at that time frame. And what I tell girls all the time is if you can make it past this point, if you can get into the, I'm one month out, I'm three weeks out, you're good. Yeah. Just don't do anything crazy right now. Just stick 100% to the plan right now because I promise you, once you get inside of that one month out, you're going to be good, right? Yeah. That's when everything starts to kind of go, we dial right, we, we coast that, we coast that plane right down onto the runway at that point, right? But you've yeah. got to get past this part, this part, this five week out freak out part because it happens every single day time every time it happens to me too every time it's that between that five to six week out mark is when my brain starts going oh crap did i do enough you know that's when it hits and that's when you are the most vulnerable so don't do anything crazy then i don't know about you but like i'm in a lot of these facebook groups and stuff and you'll see this is the time frame where girls come on and and post anonymously they're like i just screwed up i just went and ate a bunch of cookies or i just went and went went ham on my on my rice or my popcorn or whatever it is that they're that is their thing you know what i mean and it's this time frame every time every single time so i mean at this point you should be like very depleted you should be you know and like i said it's it's a very vulnerable time Mm -hmm. and i do think that, that there is also really understanding the emotion that you're feeling. Cause I do think that a, f- um, a level of anxiety and the feeling of fear can also be excitement, right? Like you're yes. five weeks out, like 
it's almost here and you're, you know, really dialing in your posing and you're really starting to see the look and your suit fits. And mm -hmm. that's also a form of like, oh my God, like it's coming and it's, mm -hmm. it's coming around the corner. So, you know, almost trying to turn that fear also into excitement. Anxiety can be a form of both. It could be happy and, and, and it just, you know, regular anxiety. So, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it is hard, but I, like I said, I think it starts from the comparison game. But in addition to that, the point that you brought up is just, you know, listening to all the noise because you are going to hear noise. You are going to hear opinions that are different than what you and your coach are doing. Mm -hmm. But your coach should know you front, back, side to side and placing a plan in place that they think is going to work best for you. Sean and I, I know prep completely differently. Mm -hmm. I can't wait prep the way Sean does and she can't prep the way I do. But we both end up at the end of the day getting stage lean on, on a pro level. So that's right. It's it, but Jamie knows how to work both of us mm -hmm. completely differently. But if I was just going off of what Sean posts every week, I would think that my plan is completely wrong. Right. But it's not. It's That's just not. what works for me. So it is. It's staying in your lane. And sometimes right. you just got to get off social. Like, yeah. you know, if you're that vulnerable in prep, there have been preps where I just had to get off social. If yep. you guys know, I haven't really been posting the last six weeks. I needed to get off social the past six weeks for my mental health. That's yeah. okay. Sometimes you have yeah. to take a step back just so you can kind of figure out what's going on in your own brain, get confident in that, and then move forward. Yes. And then there's that other piece of self-sabotage too, where it's not about like doing those things, but it's actually you're afraid of succeeding. That's you a great that? Yeah. yeah. Yep, I see it a lot they, they, where you, you're like this, the girl's like on a roll and you know, she's going to do well, like she, whatever well is, you know, that's subjective of course, but all of a sudden they, they start seeing that too. And then they're afraid that they're actually going to hit that. And then they do stuff yeah. to screw it up. You're right. I see that a lot. That's a good one to bring up. Yeah. They, they are af almost afraid of winning or doing yeah. So they want to create an excuse if right. they don't do well. That's right. That's it. And that's a tough it's one. Defense, a it's a defense one. mechanism. Yeah. It's a defense mechanism. Yeah. It's a, it's yeah. a way to say, okay, if I, if I, I really feel like I'm doing everything right, but if everything goes wrong, then I have a reason why this is Correct. my reason why this is my reason why everything went wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah in a way like, whatever they that show is. up and they've done everything right, but it doesn't go the way they think, then they're mm -hmm. like, well, then what am I going to blame it on? Mm -hmm. Um, yep. and yeah. So then people start to overeat and then, you know, those are the check-ins you're getting and you're like, you looked really great a week ago. What the heck happened? Did anything change? No, nope, nothing changed. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. no, so, changed. yeah, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that, that is a good one. And I yep. think, and I think that's fair. And I think that when you're feeling, if you, if you do come to a point where you're feeling that you have to speak up right away, like mm -hmm. to your coach, to whoever, you know, that way we can, you know, talk you through it, bring it back down. And most of the time too, like, you know, these are emotional, th th this is an emotional response and you have to understand where people are coming from versus shutting it down because right. to them it's real. So you right. have to meet them where they're at and talk them through it. And that's where I try to bring up photos and show them like, yep. here is what I'm seeing. Let me talk you through my spreadsheet, my throat pot process, what I've been doing with you, da, da, da. And I give them that data that they were like, oh, okay. So yeah, I am right where I need to be. Sometimes yes. people just need to see that you kind of had that process and that you, they are at that point where they should be in the process. Yes. Yep. And then, you know, also I, I've been a product of this myself and I know I've done things in the past where I kind of give myself an out, you know, one of the things that, that I tell people, like we were just talking about with Phoebe being tall, I'm like, oh, well, I'm tall. So even if I do really well from me, I'm still not going to place well because I'm tall and I don't look like everybody else. You know, that's my, that's my limiting excuse. You know what I mean? So we all have something. We all have something where we stick it in the back of our head and this is our excuse why we didn't do as well as we should have done. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, and I go back to you were along with me with this whole process with Hawaii and Japan, right? I didn't give myself any limiting beliefs going into those shows, right? I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to self-sabotage. And that's why when everything went wrong in Hawaii because of my period, that's why that hurt so bad. Because I was like, I did everything to a T. I did everything I was supposed to do and still this fucked up. You know what I mean? But I didn't let that sit. I didn't let myself sit in that, right? And I was like, I'm going to make the, make this right going into Japan. And that's why for me, Japan was such a success because I was like, well, I'm not going to allow this to be 
where I end. This isn't going to be, this is going to be my, this isn't going to be my, um, my self sabotage problem issue, whatever you want to call it. I can't think of the right words right now, but you know what I'm saying. So I'm like, I'm going to go into Japan guns blazing. You know, I'm going to do the best I possibly can. I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to check everything off my list. And that's why I was so happy with what I came out of that show with, you know what I mean? I felt like that was the best package I've ever put on stage because I didn't give myself any out you know? So yeah, sometimes shit's going to happen. I mean, I, I couldn't have planned getting my period like the day before a freaking show and ballooning up six, seven pounds. I couldn't have planned that. And it hurt. It, it fucking hurt. But it's not a matter of what happens to you. It's how you respond to it that makes a difference. Right. And Absolutely. the other part of this too, is that through that process, I was very open about everything too. I had so many people that were like, so encouraged about that as well. So it's like, you know, you got to remember people like real people don't need you to be the best all the time. They want to see you. They want to see you give your all and they want to be there and be like, Oh, she really, really you know, gave it everything she had. So that's, that means I can do that too. You know what I mean? And at the end of the day, I survived through it. Right. And I came out of it with a win on my, on my book, you know, with my best look on stage in Japan. That was my, that was my win. Right. And people will relate to that. I think a lot of times some of the self-sabotage comes into play because we think people care and they do, but they want to, they want to see you as a real person. They don't want to see you as that perfected social media, like handcrafted thing that's been put up there. Like, you know, that's why people don't like Photoshop so much and they don't like all that crap because it's, it's not real. They, it's they'll not real. relate to you. Yeah. They'll relate to you better if you're real, you know? And we see people out there that have millions of followers and they use all this crap. They use all this, this stuff that makes, that makes their life look perfect, you know? Yeah. But followers are not real most of the time, meaning they're not, they're not, the, they're not real they're life. Right. Yeah, well, they're not real life. They're that, real life, they're that, you know? yeah, that too. So I think, I think, I think too, like setting, setting the realistic expectation, right? Obviously we all show up to win. Mm -hmm. I mean, but the, most fun shows I've had were the ones that I took the pressure off of myself yes. and just let it happen. Yeah. Um, you know, with the, the before I got my pro card, my warm up show was Girl Power. wasn't supposed to be there. I showed up very perfectly ready for fifth place or or lower, yeah. and I ended up taking first. When I got my pro card, I showed up to Junior USA's with thinking that I was just happy to be there finally at a national show, and obviously I wasn't going to get it there. Got it there. You know, my first pro win. I told you guys, to, or I talked about this on Jamie's podcast, which hasn't come out yet, but you know, I, it was between me and another athlete, the athlete, they actually had the other athlete. They had actually had winning the morning show. I came back and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go out there and have fun. And I ended yeah. up winning the night show and getting my first pro win. So it's almost when I just kind of released the expectation and just said, I just want to go and have fun. Yep. I was rewarded for that. So it's, yep. it's, it's and a, a part of that was me getting out of my own head, right? Just mm -hmm. releasing any kind of expectation, fear, stress that I placed on myself. And I just let really my body just do the thing, do my thing, yeah. go have fun out there. And I, I produce my best result that way. So it's also about just getting your expectations underlined. We, again, we all go out there to win, you know, everybody is going out there to win. So that's mm -hmm. where it's just about focusing on you. And did you beat your last package? Did you beat your best? Also for most athletes, they get better the more they compete, right? Like right. the first yeah. show of the season is your warm up show for a that's reason. Right. It's not meant to be a hundred percent. It's meant to go, see how you look, get feedback, get back to the drawing board come out a couple weeks later, get a little bit better, get more feedback, come back out. The, the higher you get in the ranks, that's what that looks like. You're never coming right. out hundred percent, or maybe you shouldn't be coming out hundred percent your first show. You got nowhere to go. <laughs> keep going. Exactly. Yeah. So it's also just kind of knowing what the, what the plan is with your coach. That way yeah. you know, you're showing up to your warm-up show. We know we're not hundred percent today. Okay, so I'm showing up 85%, blah, blah, blah. And then going back too, to what you said earlier, sometimes athletes get in their own way because they like a look on themselves yeah. that's not the criteria. That's right. So they're trying to show up too lean yep. and that's unfortunately not the look they want. They actually yeah. maybe need about be about three to five pounds higher. For some people, it's about eight pounds higher, mm -hmm. higher than they think they need to show up. Laura Lee is a good example like of that. Look. Yeah, Laura Lee is a great example of that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, you know, sometimes you get in your own way because you 
feel like you like that look, but unfortunately yes. it's not the look that's going to get awarded. And your coach is telling you, Hey, listen, we need to be leaner or we need to be fuller. We need to add, you know, more food back in, fill you, fill you out. And the athlete's like, no, you know, they're not following the meal plan that the coach gives because they don't want to, because they don't feel like that look is what they want to bring. So there now there's a difference, right? Are you trying to show up to the bikini stage and fit the criteria that's going to get awarded? Or are you now just looking to walk around in the body that you think you want to be right. looking like all your year round. None is wrong, but adjust your expectation for when you're showing up to a show with criteria that you have to meet in order to get awarded for. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, a good example of something like that is that, uh, that bow from, where's she from? Somewhere in Europe. Where's she okay. from? The one that competes about? a lot? And yeah. Does, okay. Yeah. So if you remember, like the, the whole talk with her the last couple of years is she just keeps coming in how she wants to look versus the criteria. Um, and now she just switched coaches over to, over to James with team Atlas and everything. And so that to me, I don't, again, I don't, I'm just from the outside looking in, that tells me she's thinking in the back of her head, I got to be closer to the criteria in order to be able to do better. You know what I mean? She's winning shows in Europe, but she's not doing anything when she comes here to the States because she's, we've talked about this before. The European look is very different from the United States look and she's getting docked when she comes here. So, you know, something clicked in her head finally, where she's just like, okay, I realize if I want to get better, I got I got to match the criteria versus bridge the gap look that I want to look. Yeah. 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 You know? And, and I get that too. Like that's hard. You know, work really, really hard to achieve X look. Right. And maybe you want to, you like that look and you want to, you know, have it, but Again, that, that, that's okay as long as you're adjusting the expectation in terms of competing then, you know. That's but right. I would also say, too, that the majority of the time when people like the look they like, it's not a realistic look to be year-round. So there's a whole right. other rabbit hole when it comes to that in terms of health, walking around 10% body fat 24-7 and things like that. But, you know, it is. it is. It's just difficult, you know. So at the end of the day, to me, the self-sabotage comes from you, you know. Yeah. It, and your mentality, what expectations do you have for yourself? Also realizing that hormones is, are completely altered when you are this far into prep at that five week out mark and you cannot see yourself. This is why Sean and I do not coach ourselves. You know, right. we are coaches. We could coach yep. ourselves. We could not because, mm -hmm. you know, I give so much credit to people that self coach, like so much yeah. credit. It I can't is, look at myself objectively. I can't do I it. I can't either. I really can't. I really can't. Like people like cut your head off and try, like I try to each time that I submit a check in a Jamie, like look at myself and go, hmm, I wonder what she's going to change. But And most of the times I'm on the same page as her and kind of what she's doing. But when I am five weeks out, I cannot do that. No. Like I am like, I'm not ready. Da, da. Like, so it's, it, we all go through it. And yeah. that's, that's why we have our person that we rely on. And again, it just goes back to your coach and you and that communication and just keeping your head on straight. And if your coach says we're behind, you know, like if you're coming to them and you're like, I think, I think I'm behind. And the coach is like, yeah, we're behind. Like mm -hmm. you gotta be ready for that. That answer yep. too, because then that means you have to push. Yep. Um, so if an athlete comes to me and then, you know, they're, they're like, I think I'm behind. I'm like, we are. We are yeah. behind because I don't know about you, but I'm I'm harder on myself than anybody else. Like I'm, I, I know when oh, I look at myself, yeah. I'm way harder on myself than than a coach would be. I, I you can't. know what's interesting? We're harder on ourselves because we know how much we can push. But sometimes as a as a as a coach, and this is me being vulnerable right now to all of you listening, it's it's hard to push your athletes, right? Yeah. We don't want to put them on two hours of cardio yeah. a day. Agreed. We don't want to drop their food because we know how that feels. Yep. But we want to win too mm -hmm. right so that's why i try to always encourage like suffering is a part of this sport and unfortunately yep. like i have to be the hand on that sometimes yes. but we also have to know as athletes that's what we're signing up for this is yes. the this is the definition of our sport you know so that's where it is hard as athletes is that uh -huh. it, it's it's hard for us as coaches to push our athletes sometimes because yep. we don't want to do that to them but it's necessary that's why that's we right. do it too <laughs> that's right absolutely absolutely i i'll be the first one to tell you i hate doing 90 minutes of cardio but i had to do it last not this year but last year in order to get Absolutely. stage lean i just yeah i had to yeah <laughs> I, I, always, like, I, I am i am always a 90 minute cardio person deep in yeah. prep. it is what it is it's yeah what i've accepted it's my body type there are girls that could do 30 minutes of cardio at max i'm in I'm between like, i'm in between i can't do i don't i don't like having to do i was behind last year that's why i had to do 90 i mean it is what it is i wasn't behind this year but i was last year and 
I'm that person that I get real stringy real quick. So I have to, I'm like in the back of my head, again, that self-sabotage aspect. It's like, well, if I push really hard, I'm going to get stringy. So, you know, it's at the back of my head, but I'm like, but I have to push hard in order to get stage lean. So you're always constantly fighting, always constantly fighting in your head. You know what I mean? So, and part of that too was, you know, I look back at that from not this past year, but the year before Jamie told me I was, I was being too aggressive with my show choices, you know, before we even, before we even settled on them, she's like, you're being aggressive. <laughs> I was like, but I want to do this. So I'm going to, <laughs> you know, so she's got to do what she's going to do as a, as a coach to get me there. And that was, that was me. That was all me doing that. You know what I mean? So, you know, she's like, you know, I'm glad we did this. I'm glad we got you up there because you really wanted to do that. She's like, but it wouldn't have been my choice. <laughs> like, okay. uh, and I experience that all the time too with athletes. Like I create a plan for them and then they're like, no, that doesn't work. Let's do this plan. I'm like, all yeah. right, that's not my choice, but I'm going to support you, yeah. you know? but we're going to have to push like yep. this. That's right. This is the expectation now. You know, I would rather a little bit more time or, but, and they're like, nope. Let's do it. I'm like, all right, but this yeah. is the expectation that we're gonna do to get there. And as right. long as you guys ready to roll, I'm fine. You know, as long as yep. they're healthy, you know, all right. the internal factors and things like yes. that. But yeah, absolutely. You know, coaching should be a collaborative relationship. It's not a yes. dictatorship, or else it doesn't work. There, there That's has right. to be. Plan in place for that specific athlete and what's going to make them tick. And I think mm -hmm. that's a lot of times is where coaches come from is like, this is the process and this is the way to do it. And the athlete can't buy in. So if the athlete can't buy in and give a hundred percent, both of you guys are just spinning your wheels. And that's where this like animosity and coach to athlete relationship just can't work, which that's I think right. is one of our questions this week too. Yeah, actually. Yeah, it is. Um, so you want to just segue into that? Sure. Yeah, as well. Let's yeah. talk about it since we're here anyway. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show this. I'm going to read the entire question, but the, the, the basic gist of it is, have you ever had to fire a client? So let me pull this up. It says, um, this is a comment on an episode a few, like a month ago or something like that. She said, uh, I know Jordan said she wouldn't take on clients who may want to prep too quickly or because they're, uh, or, or before they're ready, but have either of you ever had to work with a client and you as the coach had to decide and tell them that you want to stop working with them? We hear about athletes who switch coaches for whatever reason, but are there instances that you've been working with a client for X amount of months or years and you finally decide you know that this isn't a good match? What were the reasons for you wanting to part ways? Have you ever had to fire a client? Yeah. Um, hasn't happened many times. I can think off the top of my head once, but I know it's happened maybe twice. Mm -hmm. Um, what I will say about this is most of the time, if I'm bringing it to the table of when I, when I release a client or I suggest that they go find an alternate coach, it's because I feel like I've done everything possible for that athlete that I can do as a coach. And I know that I'm not a good fit for them because my pre approaches aren't working. So when any, anytime I'm firing a client, it is coming from a place of, I am not the best person for you. And I want you to have someone that is going to be good for you. Um, so most of the time when this happens, it's just because of coaching styles. You know, we have to remember at the end of the day, we are all people and we all mm -hmm. have different personalities and different approaches. And that's why there are so many great coaches. You look at all the top coaches in our industry and they all coach completely different ways and have completely different personalities. Yeah. And as an athlete, we are all drawn to certain uh, personalities and certain ways of coaching. And that is, that's human nature. So mm -hmm. sometimes people, you know, hire a coach with the idea of like, oh, I just want like this person, but they yeah. didn't really do the research on the approach or how their feedback is and you know some people really like a direct data focused you know you know very intense coach i would say that's a little bit of my coaching style i'm very hands-on i'm i'm very specific i'm very very data driven and for another athlete you know one athlete they're like oh i love this you know i love yes. your your honesty i love that you keep pushing me you know i love your feedback things like that where another athlete might want more a more gentle approach you know they kind of want a little bit more flexibility and you know not so much data and 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 things like that. And again, neither one is right or wrong. It's just what's best for that athlete. So if the athlete that doesn't really want to, you know, take their fasted weight every day and do pre post meals and, you know, really be specific on, you know, the certain foods that they're logging and things like that, like I require, I'm going to be too much for them. And so right. when they're in with me and their adherence is low, it's not because of, it's not 
that the plan is wrong. It's just not the right approach for them. So Correct. I'm getting yeah. frustrated because the athlete's not following the plan. They're getting frustrated because my expectations aren't getting met. So I'm coming to them saying, Hey, listen, I know that there's a better approach for you out there. It's just not one that I can provide you. So I think yeah. that it's best that we finish out our contract. I'll support you however I can. And you go find a different coach. And most of the time they already felt that way. I already yeah. I brought it to them. Yeah. Um, and then one other time there was just an athlete that just was lying, just yeah. Full on, on anything that they were doing. Lab work was supporting the lie and it was just getting to an unhealthy point that mm -hmm. I did not feel comfortable having my name attached to that from a coaching perspective and I had to let them go. Yeah. Um, so really, I'm really, really will willing to work with any client that's honest and communicative. Yeah. And, and my clients, I think, can say that. You know, they always say I'm so communicative. I'm so upfront. They always know kind of what to expect, what the expectation is. And as long as they know that, it kind of works. It's just so well- yeah because I'm so communicative. But again, some people, it's too much. Yeah. Well, and I'll come at this from a little bit of a different vantage point because I've just started coaching recently, but I've been doing posing coaching for a long time. So um, I think a lot of times on social media, we see coaches get bashed a lot, you know, um, for whatever reason it might be. And the main reason for that is because coaches don't usually come out and defend themselves because they want to stay professional and they don't want to talk badly about their clients because if they do one thing, if they talk about badly about one of their clients then everybody starts questioning, well, well, are they talking about everybody like that? You know what I mean? So the coach is put into a bad position where they can't say anything one way or the other, right? They can't say anything good. They can't say anything bad because it just looks like they're, they're not professional. So a lot of times I think athletes get away with murder, to be perfectly honest with you, when it comes to that kind of stuff. And I'm saying this from vantage point of not being a coach and being in this industry for 15 years and seeing this happen, right? A lot of times it is the coach is just as, just as culpable as the, as the athlete, but I, I find it's, it's disproportionate when we're talking about online talk because of that, because the athlete doesn't really have anything to lose. The, the coach does. So the coach has to keep their mouth shut, right? So I do say that a lot. Um, and I do think a lot of it comes down to the real thing is, is that athlete did all the things that you just said. They, they picked a coach because it's that particular person and not because that method actually worked for them. I think that's what it really comes down to at the end of the day. They just didn't do enough research on their own. Um, and a lot of times it's just that the athlete has high expectations for what they expect is going to happen. They think this particular coach, because they, they train people and most people go pro or go to the Olympia, they think because they hire on that coach, that coach is going to do the same, th same thing for them. When in reality, they got to work the plan themselves in order for anything to happen. You know, so if you're not doing the plan, you're not going to you're not going to rise. You know what I mean? So um, I think a lot of times that's what again, that's what we kind of see on the outside. And we assume that that coach was the was the problem when in reality it was a dual thing or it was just the athlete just not doing their part. Um, on my end of it, as far as not working with clients and stuff, again, I happen to do this with, with a coaching client because I've only been doing this for a short period of time. Uh, but when it comes to posing um, and my business and everything like that, I, I do have sponsored athletes every year and um, bring people on and, and bring them on as a, they're a representative of my brand. And I've only ever once had to let go of a sponsored athlete. And it was because they went online and talked shit about the judging. And it was terrible. Like I was, I, it, it was this person, this, this particular person I brought on because I thought they were, they were, they're brand new. And I thought they had a lot of potential. I really enjoyed like their overall spirit and how they, how they presented themselves and all that kind of stuff. But as soon as they got into prep, it was like everything, everybody else was wrong and they were right. And, you know, they came out and they, they thought they should have won the overall at a show and they did, they placed like third in their class, you know, that kind of thing. So they came out and they started talking so much shit about the judging. And I'm just like, you can't. And again, when I bring athletes on as sponsored athletes, they sign an agreement that they're not going to do stuff like that, you know, meaning they're going to represent themselves in a high standard. They're not going to go out, out there. And like I was just talking about, they're going to be professional, right? A coach has to be professional. An athlete, a sponsored athlete has to be professional as well, right? Absolutely. So that was the only time I ever had to let somebody go out of their contract. The only time. So, Fair. you know, I, I just be professional. That's, That's it. it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> be professional, you know? And like you said, if, if it doesn't work, if you're not happy in the situation, have that conversation and move on. And that's yeah. it. 
it's really, yeah, it's really so very easy. Question box this week. Like, how do I approach my uh, coach if I don't like something or if I'm not agreeing with something in the plan? And I said, communicate to them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's another thing I feel like too, is coaches, sometimes athletes don't tell us when there's an issue. So, right. Yeah. And all of a sudden they're just canceling and they don't tell us why. And sometimes we don't know why at all. We'll, we never find out. Or sometimes a year from now they send us a message and they're like, I'm really sorry. I should have came to you. This was what was wrong. And you yeah. were actually right. And we should have just yes. talked about it. Yes. So all I responded back to that question box was you need to communicate with your coach, you know? That's right. And we talked about, you know, coaching expectations on a few podcasts ago. You know, if you bring something to your coach and you don't agree with something or you don't like something or you're questioning something and the coach isn't responsive to that, right? Like if they don't change it or they don't say, okay, I understand what you're saying, but this is why I'm doing it. Now, right. how do you feel about it? And they're not right. bringing that to you and they're not listening, then that's a red flag, right? Mm -hmm. I want to do as a coach in this situation at the end of the day, I want to know I did everything I could with that athlete before I'm thinking about that we need to part ways. I want yeah. to change plan. I want to communicate. I want to talk through it. And if we come to a point where there's just no agreeing, then we know we did everything possible. We can walk away knowing that we did it and we were amicable and things like that. But sometimes I feel like it. we just, as as culture and society and in our, in our age brackets, we have a really hard time with confrontation when it's mm -hmm. not confrontation, it's just communication. Right. And it might just right. not be like all, you know, butterflies and rainbows. Um, yeah. But it's, it's it's not what you say. It's how you say it, you know. Exactly. And it's okay to communicate. Hi, Drew. You want to say hi on the podcast? <laughs> He's walking back. Like, hey, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> but no, you're right. It, it is. It's absolutely not what you say. It's how you say it. It's how you're yeah. it, you know. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I love now about the, because we, you know, we use the trainerize app to talk with the clients and all this stuff is the little voice memos in there. Because I know the sometimes when I, yeah, and I know sometimes when I type stuff, it sounds very blunt. And I yes. know, right, by reading it, I'm like, that sounds really not how I want it to sound. So, yeah. <laughs> sometimes like, a client will be like, you know, they'll respond back and be like, I'm so sorry. Like they felt yeah. like I was yeah. I'm like, no, I'm not I'm being, not I'm like, I'm just. Yeah. yeah. Like, so I, I love like, like, little I little like hi, I just want you to hear my voice. We're yes. all good. Nobody's mad. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that voice memo because I can have inflection and, and, and all of that too. So sometimes it really is just how you read it. Like you could read something and just be in a bad mood and read it one way. And you're like, oh, and then you go back and read it again and you read it in a completely different mood. And you're like, oh, that wasn't that bad. You know what that I mean? That literally but... <laughs> happened to me and Jamie like two weeks ago. She said something in my check-in and I'm like, oh my God, she's unhappy about this. Yeah. And then saw her like two days later and I'm like, I'm really sorry about that. She's like, what are you sorry about? We're fine. And I'm like, yeah. Everything's fine. Your physique's fine. And I'm like, oh, well, I read it. Like, she's like, that's not what I meant at all. And yeah. Like, yeah. And I yeah. was, I was killing myself for two days. I could have just wrote back and been like, give me more context, whatever. But mm -hmm. yeah, I should have just communicated. Yep. Pick up the phone or whatever. You know what I mean? And exactly. Like, and like I said, I mean, I love that because, you know, I, again, I'm just starting this coaching thing. So I have a lot of new clients and some of them just have want explanations and stuff. And sometimes I'm typing and I'm reading the type and I'm reading what I'm typing. I'm like, that just sounds really abrasive. <laughs> it, just, it just does. So I'm going to go in and just, just do a voice memo because then I can just tell, tell them exactly what I'm thinking. And then that, then they don't think that I'm mad at them or anything like that. You know what I mean? Like I'm not like, I'm just trying to explain how you're supposed to do this. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a lot better. I, I, I voice inflection is everything i hate communicating like important stuff through text because it does it can came off it can come off really wrong and that's not how i meant for it to come off at all and i tried of course to that. yeah i tried something yeah. like I'm, I'm just being direct i'm not i'm not mad i'm just being direct direct <laughs> yes yes good thing to i'm like i put, put emojis on the end of everything that i write isn't that so exactly. bad like i do that all the time i have to i have to add emojis on the stuff just so that people know i'm, I'm doing it like lighthearted. you know i'm not yeah. trying to be a bitch like i'm, yeah. just, I'm just trying to get the point across it's hard oh, to navigate our in our space with yeah both being online that is that that is something that we continuously have to navigate is you know emotion through text it's yes. very hard so. yes Yes. So let's move on. Actually, this is this is another question that um, that kind of works with what we're talking about, too, as far as setting a show date, the best way to stay on track. We didn't cover this one yet, did we? I don't think we did, right? We talked lightly about it uh, yeah. last week, but not this directly. Um, okay. Is setting a show date the best way to stay on track? <sighs> For most people in their brain, yes. Um, mm -hmm. I would say it's, it's not the best way to stay on track. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's 
it's very difficult to kind of commit to one show because a lot can change. You know, you guys know my story about, you know, again, my amateur year, like the the shows that I thought I was going to do, I didn't even end up on and I came out yeah. earlier in the season. So like if I attach to just one show, there's just so much room for something to go wrong at that point or not hitting that show. I always like to give a time frame. Um, and within the time frame, we have a target show, but with setting the expectation of this is the target show, but it might be a week sooner, it might be a couple weeks after, we're gonna let your body tell us when it's yeah. ready. But we're mm -hmm. shooting for this show, but be flexible. I don't let my athletes book or register for shows until two weeks out from the stage, knowing that yeah. we are going to show up for that event um, because there has been so many times that I've had to change shows and things like that. Yeah. It's very normal. Um, so I think having a date frame is a good thing. That way you're not putting too much pressure on yourself for five weeks out. You know that you have four to seven weeks out and mm -hmm. that kind of lightens the load a little bit. Um, that, that to me is the best approach. Yeah. And I would say too, because what happens is when, when you do set that date, you do pay your registration fees, all that kind of stuff. People don't want to back out regardless of what they look like. They, they want to get on stage for that show day. And, you know, a good example is I took a, over a client's prep um, just the last couple of weeks and things like that. I've mentioned that a few times and she's already signed up for the show. If it was me that was coaching her from the beginning, I wouldn't have had her go into the show, but she wants to get it done, you know? And I'm like, I get that. I understand that. So like we talked about before, you've committed to this. We got to put our blinders on and go. You know what I mean? Um, you know, if I had yeah. had your prep from the beginning, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had you go into the show at all, but she's already registered for it, you know? So we're going to do our best to make sure she, she feels good about it. And she, she gets on stage happy and, and all those kinds of things. And then we'll assess from there as far as what we do at that point. Um, but that's, that's, that's a real thing. It's like, if you set, sign up for this thing, five, four or five months in advance, you're, you're set, you, you gotta go, you know? And, um, the way that stuff is now, the way that all of our travel stuff is now, like you, you can still register at the hotel. You can still do your, um, uh, flights because flights are refundable now too. Like everything since the whole pandemic, everything is refundable or cancelable when it comes to travel situation. So you might as well sign up for all that stuff and get that book because you can move it if you need to. You know, yeah. that, that's always, I mean, that's I've always been seeing and hearing this a lot more with athletes that mm -hmm. they are doing things kind of really backwards just because they don't yeah. know they sign yeah. up for a show, then they hire a coach and then they're yeah. like, Hey coach, we're doing this show. Yes. And anybody watching that's just, it's not the way you do it. You first right. hire the coach and then you guys come up with the game plan together. And then you wait for your coach to tell you when to sign up for the show, because it really just depends on when your body's ready. And now you're putting right. this major stress and expectation on yourself and your coach to get you yes. there. Um, yep. you know, if you want to hit that show in your hometown, because you heard about it and your friends in the gym are doing it, that's fine. Just Mm -hmm. pump the brakes on registering. Like yes. just let, let's try to get there first. Um, but it is not on my roster, but it's something I'm hearing more and more of athletes doing in the amateurs. And yes, that's not the, um, the right way to do it. You kind of want to start, get that game plan. And then when you know you're ready, sign up for the show. That way you're not committed to anything. If you want right. to move your show. Well, and I think also people underestimate the financial commitment to a show as well. Like they just yeah. assume that, you know, they, they sign up for it and register with the register registration fees and assume they're done. I'm like, you're not done. Like <laughs> that's, that's one fee. I was like, you got to buy your, your NPC registration. You got to book your tan, your hair, your makeup, your suit, your posing, your shoes, your jewelry, your coach, like your food, your supplements, all those kinds of things. The entry fee is one thing. It's one thing. It's a luxury and, sport. Yep. Yeah, and it's it's an expensive. Luxury. I've done I've done this as a live feed before where we go through the potential costs and one show. We should do that on one here. One show. We should do that yeah, on one here. one show alone is going to cost you about three grand to five I was going to say three grand, grand minimum. For, for one show. Three grand minimum for one. for prep. Yep. Mm -hmm. For everything that would just, yeah. But that would be yeah. a great show. We should do that as yeah. a as a special. Absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. then that and that changes every year too because the expenses change and things like that yeah. as well too. And listen, that's that seems like a lot and... off the bat, right? These are obviously monthly fees. You break it down into a monthly right. fee. And what I like to do with my athletes too that are coming on and we start prep and things like that is I send them a purchase list out the gate and they start yeah. purchasing things one at a time. They do their MPC yep. card one month. They do their jewelry one mm -hmm. month. They're starting to slowly buy things. It's not three grand off the bat, right? Um, yes, but it it is it is something to keep in mind with competing that this is not a pinch a penny sport. Like it's that's there right. are ways to save money here and there but most of the time you, you got to be financially sound it's it is yes. a very luxurious sport 
And as you as you move along to like if you're doing like three shows in a year or something, the expenses do get less because yes. again, you, you've you've bought your membership card already, you've already got your coaching going, so you're doing just the monthly fees at that point. You're not doing all the all the additional stuff, you know. So they do get less, but not by a lot. So like yeah. you know, if you're doing one show, it's probably about three grand. If you're doing two, it's probably about five. You know that kind of thing. So so on and so forth. Um, you know, once you've got your suit, you're done. You don't have to buy another suit. You know those kinds of things. But those initial costs out the gate. They can, they, they rack up real quick. They rack yeah. up real quick. So there's that. Um, and then also, you know, the other part of this, I think, we, I think we touched on this before, but if you're using a date in order to be set on, on a goal, that makes me worry about what's going to happen once the show's over with, you know, because all of a sudden now that's gone. So now all of a sudden you can't eat right. You can't train right. You can't do everything right because the show's over. Ooh, that's going to set you're you up for a bad always. You're yes. in prep always. Just mm -hmm. what's the goal at that time? Yeah. Yeah. And this is a new concept too over the last few years because like I said, when I first started, it was like you paid your coach for prep for you know your 12 <laughs> weeks and then you were done. You were done. And then you just go do your thing until you're ready to prep again. That's, that's just how it went. Yeah. The but athletes I take healthy. on that they tell me, you know, I did a show and then after the show – I didn't have any more coaching, right? Whatever it was, they paid for the 12 weeks, the 12 weeks was over. They don't do a reverse diet with that coach. They choose yep. at that time to end with the coach because the show's over. Those are the athletes that are coming to me with the most metabolic damage. Obviously they didn't follow a reverse diet. So they're up 30, 40 pounds from stage weight. They didn't get lab work done before, after, during the prep. They have no clue where they're at, you know, internally. Um, so if you get, if you get anything from this question, stick with your coach for yes. another 12 weeks after the show, whether you're planning on doing your show or not, you, you prepped for 12 weeks and then you got to reverse for 12 weeks. Just have right. that in your brain to finish the job. That is a yes. full prep getting to lean and then getting back to normal. normal. You don't just go 12 weeks and cutting, 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 and then you just start eating again and you just go back to your normal weight. Not yeah. the way that happens. Mm -hmm. You have to have that recovery coming out of the show prep. Yes. And also just as a, so it's not fully like a scare, scare tactic. It's okay if you've done that before, because I definitely did that for a lot of years <laughs> I was, and I'm fine now, you know, yeah. I'm totally and fine. I was with a coach. So yeah. it was my personal decision, right? So again, yeah. it's not, but it's not bulletproof to have a coach, but it was really nice when I was having those hard weeks to have that accountability. I still have to yes. check in with someone. I still have to take photos next, the next day with someone. So even if you're kind of blowing the reverse, the, the blow is going to be less because yes. you have that accountability that you're checking in with someone. So some choices are going to be better knowing you have that. That's right. And again, things have, have, have improved a lot as far as information is concerned too. Like I said, when I started in this, we didn't, that wasn't even a thing. Reverse diet was not a term that anybody used. It didn't exist, you know? So you're, you're, you're okay. If you screwed it up before, just realize that there are ways to do it that are better, that are going to be better for you. And you're going to feel better about it too. So just keep that in mind going forward. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So don't, don't, don't shoot yourself in the foot after the show, basically. That's it. That's <laughs> um, it. So we got a couple other questions here too. So let's go ahead and talk about this one because I think this is actually um, something that a lot of people deal with, which is skin tightening methods for master's competitors. Um, there's only so much that you can do, right? But there are things that you can do. So when we're getting past the age of 35, 40, 45, when we're going up, our collagen production in our skin gets less and less and less and less and less. So the more, like we were just talking about, the more damage that you do from coming in and out of a prep, you can have skin that, that stretches, the skin elasticity isn't there anymore. Maybe you've had children, so the skin elasticity isn't great, all those kinds of things. So what can you do to tighten? So the first thing I'm going to say is that most of the lotions and potions and things like that out there are snake oil. You know, like if they just, they don't actually work, right? Um, they'll work for a time frame. There was a, there's a, there's a time frame where there was what the stuff called, um, what was it called? Nerium, I think, uh, was big. It was an MLM kind of thing. And, uh, yeah, it, it plumps up your skin and all that kind of stuff, but you got to get rid of that to go into, into prep. You can't have that stuff on your skin. So all of a sudden your skin goes back to normal. So it's just, it's, it's just a snake oil thing. It's a temporary fix, right? So you can do cosmetic surgeries and things like that for, you know, the mommy pouch and things like that. People do it all the time, tummy tucks, that kind of deal. But there are things that you can do just on a daily basis to help with the elasticity, help with collagen production, all of that. Um, the question that was sent in was about the red light therapy. I have a red light panel in my bathroom 
It just hangs on the wall in the bathroom. Um, you know, being in, in front of that red light helps with collagen production in your skin. So um, I do that personally. I do seven minutes on front, seven minutes on the back, three times a week. Real easy. Want to jump out of the shower, and that just helps again with the skin, the skin collagen production, and all of that. Um, going into Morpheus Eight, that's something that a lot of people can start doing. It's an expensive procedure. Uh, but it absolutely helps with skin tightening. So go ahead and Google that a little bit, get some more information on that. It is a cosmetic procedure. It is something that you can do if you've got like a little bit of loose skin on your belly, or I've had, you know, women do it on their necks and things like that too. So it'll help to tighten those areas up if it's a little bit. Um, if it's significant skin, it's not going to do it, but if it's a little, it'll help. Right. Um, and then Sculptra is more so for your face. Uh, this is something I've done. The, Smile lines here. I did it this last year. And what Sculptra is, is it's like a filler, but it uses your own <clears throat> collagen production to fill your skin back out. So it's one of those things where when you first get it done, you see it because you got inflammation and that and the, the doctors are always like, this is what it's going to look like when it's finished, but it's going to take a few months for this to happen because it's your own body producing the collagen in those areas. So unlike a filler, um, it's natural because it's you. So it's your body going in there and actually creating collagen in those areas because of the Sculptra. So yeah, initially the result looked great and then it goes away after like a couple of weeks because the inflammation goes down and you feel like it didn't do anything. <laughs> You're like, why did I just spend a thousand dollars to get this done when it didn't do anything? But your body's working on it internally. So over the course of the next like four to six months, you see improvement. That for me was huge. Like I, I do fillers and all that kind of stuff too. I'm very open. I do fillers, do Botox, all that kind of stuff. And fillers are immediate, but the Sculptra absolutely worked better than anything I put into this. I put filler in this area before and Sculptra worked way better. It was more expensive, but it's lasted and it's, it's been a much better effect than what I had for, for filler. Um, so you can't really do that in areas on your body unless you want to spend a ton of money. <laughs> I'm not really going to do it for you, but it's something you can do for your face. Um, so those are some things you can do with your, with, um, of course, you know, fillers and Botox and stuff like that too. But Sculptra is definitely a thing that can help with your, your own collagen production. Um, those are the kinds of things. Moisturizing all the time. We've talked about this for tanning, but this is also just for in general, just making sure that your skin is, is moisturized so that you can you can have that elasticity and that bounce back. Um, my husband cracks me up because he's Spanish. So when he was a kid, he had very oily skin and he hated it when he was younger because, you know, acne and all those kinds of things. But now that he's almost 60, he just turned 59 uh, this weekend. He's like, I love the fact that I have oily skin because my skin makes me look like I'm younger now because I had this for my whole life. Those oils and stuff like that make a difference in your overall skin texture. So make sure that you're moisturizing a lot. Um, what else? What other things do you have as far as some, some things to help? Uh, you nailed it. I mean, I've seen, I, the Morpheus 8 is what I've seen most clients choose and mm -hmm. have had really great success as long as they can afford it and they finish yes. all of the treatments. Um, but at the end of the day, if the skin is that significant, a lot of them, if they choose to progress in the sport, they end up getting some sort of um, procedure done, you know, yes. skin surgery or something like that. And again, that's a personal choice. You know, I tell my master's athletes all the time, you're standing up there next to women who have had multiple children and yes. kind of on the same playing field. And there's going to be women as well that have gotten tummy tucks and the mommy mm -hmm. uh, overs and things like that. And that if that's a choice that you want to make in the future, that's fine. You know, it's, it's just about being honest with them. You know, there's nothing we can do about that skin. If it's there, unfortunately, you know, it birth life or, mm -hmm. you know, you had amazing weight loss journey and that's a part of it. Um, so, right. you know, sometimes I just say like, let's just get on stage. Let's see what it looks like. Let's see, you know, what you're doing against other people. Let's see if we could do some posing or moving mm -hmm. the skin around a little bit, see if we can hide some things and twist your belly button a certain way. Um, but ultimately if the skin is the skin, it's going to be there. So you're going to have to try one of these methods if, if it's really that noticeable for you and something that you want to change. Yes, absolutely. And this is something too that like, you have to think about this. This shouldn't be something that you do just for stage. Absolutely. It should be something that you do because you want to do it for yourself. For right? your confidence. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And that, I have no problem with that. You know, do what you, I, yeah. I'm like, I, I told my husband when I first got together with him, I was like, we can do whatever, like, we, obviously with the No Kids Club, but I was like, we can have as many babies as you want. I was like, as long as you put my body back the way it was when you first met me, I'm good. Yes. <laughs> I was like, I don't care. Yeah. Just put my body back. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's hard though. It's hard. It's hard. I get it. It's hard. Yeah, and a lot of women too, which is so cool, are coming out for the first time as a master's competitor. Yeah. So they've already mm -hmm. had kids and they didn't have bodybuilding on their mind. So, you yeah. know, it's, you know, you're kind of taking them on from that point where now versus somebody that comes out before bodybuilding, you know, they have that. Now they're coming out after having kids and now they're seeing kind of the skin. So everybody's coming out in their different phases of life. And I absolutely love it. But that's, you know, a great point. You know, if before competing, you were OK with your skin and how you felt in your skin and you're just kind of stepping on stage because you just found the sport. Like, don't do anything drastic. Like if yeah. you choose to continue and then it's starting to become an issue for you or something that you're feeling a little bit more vulnerable or self-conscious about then maybe make the choice at that time but don't do it before your first show there's no reason for that that's right because this kind of goes into our last question that we're going to cover today which is the recommendations for breast augmentation surgeries this was very specific about in pittsburgh um i don't know <laughs> so um i'm just gonna put that out there i don't know anybody in pittsburgh uh, i have this one maybe um tip I know, and I, I would have to, I would have to get the information. I know someone currently right now that is shopping for surgeons for a breast augmentation and uh, just bring them down and whatnot. And they interviewed with someone virtually who is very familiar with all of the surgeons across the United States. Okay. And the person was telling them what they're, you know, what they currently look like. They had to submit photos of their current augmentation mm -hmm. um, or not augmentation, what they want, what's important to them, et cetera. And that person was able to give them a list of people oh, they thought could help okay. them. So while that person is not the specific BA in Pittsburgh, right, right, right. Person, but it, they can help guide you based on what you look like and what your goal is for your procedure. Okay. And who, how did they, how, who's this person or do you know how to find them? Just Google. Like, I will or... need to find them. Okay. This, this um, answer just, your I, answer. I would, I'll, I'll ask the person that's shopping and ask. Oh, where cool. Well, if you, from. if you figure that out, let me know. I'll put it into the caption of the, Perfect. Of the description here. So that way you guys can Perfect. find it. But awesome. Um, so we can I kind of cover that, but also I just want to say too, because this is still a thing and I don't know why, People think that you have to have a breast augmentation to do well in, in bikini, and you don't. Just, you, no. you don't. If you want to do it, great. I did mine back in 2008 for the first time, and I would not change a thing. I'm so glad that I did it, you know, all that kind of stuff. I was not even close to competing at that point. So do you. Like, if you want to do it, cool. If you don't want to do it, cool. That's fine. I mean, look at Laura Lee. She doesn't have a breast augmentation, and she just won the Arnold. I mean, I mean, come on. Like, I think we can stuff I, those suits pretty dang good. If you know and I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I don't know if I'm Perfect. speaking out of turn, but I don't think Vanya has them either. She just won. I don't think so. Yeah, I just, she just won um, the UK. So you, you absolutely do not have to have them. Um, I know Phoebe doesn't have them. Um, you know, when Jennifer Dory does now, but when she first started getting up into like the top fives and things like that, she did not. Um, who else? I can. I just trying to think of people off my head. Ashlyn didn't have them for a long period of time. She does now. I she didn't, didn't have, have them for a long you period didn't have of time. A long period of time. Yeah. yeah. Um. So you don't absolutely don't need to have them. Absolutely don't need no. to have them. I have and several again, girls I that I want because don't. of competing either. I've told Drew since day one. I want. I wanted yeah. my breast done. That was before competing was ever on the table. You know. And yeah. It was something I always wanted to do. So. No, it, it, you definitely don't have to have them for competing. Yeah. And again, you can stuff that suit. I, I, my girls without augmentation, they still usually get like a large top, which yep. they're like, whoa, they're freaking out. But then they cut, they, 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 it comes and we start stuffing it, putting all the chicken cutlets, I call them and stuff like that. And they're like, oh, okay, this is good. Yep. It's perfect. So we could do a lot with stuff in a suit. Yeah. And I tell people <laughs> that too, when I, because I design suits for girls and I'm like, I would rather you, your suit top be too big because we can stuff it yeah. versus it being too small and you're falling out of it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's not, that's not cute. <laughs> I took a consultation with a girl this past, this past week who, you know, she showed me a picture of her suit and I was like, yeah, I'm like, you're literally falling out of that suit. Like, that's not good. We need, we need to get a different one, you know? So I would rather it be a little bit too big because we can be creative with the stuffing versus the opposite versus the opposite. Um, and that, you know, when it also, when it comes to actually finding surgeons, I think that's a great idea that you mentioned. I didn't even know that existed, but talk to people in your area. Like this is a, this is a pretty normal topic, you know, talk to people, find out where they went. That's, that's how I found my most recent doctor. So I've had a couple of surgeries. I've had four altogether. Um, 
because I had an injury. So my dog popped my capsule and I had to have them, have them replaced. And the guy that replaced them initially, when I went, when I went and got them done, he had to go in and take out skin and all this kind of stuff. It was a whole big thing. He's like, you're not going to like them because they're going to be smaller and you're not going to like that they're smaller. He's like, this is what we got to do. He's like, so in a couple of years, you're going to want to come back and get them redone. Um, and he was right. <laughs> so I was like, I don't like them smaller. Not good. Um, so I, when I went to go back, it was I think it was three three years later after the after the injury, uh, he was no longer practicing. So he, he actually had cancer, so he was no longer practicing. So I had to find a new doctor. Um, and at that point, that's when I started going to my girlfriends and being like, okay, who'd you go to, and all this kind of stuff. And that's where I found my my current doctor, who is Doctor Jabs. Um, he sponsors CCTS every year, all of that, and phenomenal doctor. So I really think the best way to find a good surgeon is just to talk to people in your area, talk to people in your area and go interview just like you would with a coach, go interview surgeons, go interview surgeons and find the one that, that you click with the best. Uh, the reason why I like Dr. Jabs, he was very, very detail oriented and very like anal about every little thing. Um, and I was like, Oh, this is the guy I want. I want operating on me. You know what I mean? So, and you can see, obviously they're going to show you pictures, things that they've done and all that kind of stuff too. But I really think it also comes down to like what we talked about is just clicking with that particular person and their methods and what they like to do um, and how they like to show it. I went, I interviewed four different doctors when I was looking to have mine redone. And he was honest with me about everything, you know, like that's the other thing too. A lot of times doctors will tell you what you want to hear and I can, sniff that out. If you, if you can't sniff that out, bring somebody with you that can sniff that out. You know, um, he told me everything that, that I needed to hear, not necessarily that I wanted to hear. Um, and he was honest about everything, you know, because I'd had this, the injury. He was like, we may need to do that. The, the surgical bra, the, um, mesh internal. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, we made it to do that. He's like, I'll have it on hand in case we need it. He's like, you may not need it. I went to other doctors where they specifically said I needed to have it. Because guess what? It costs more to put that more in. More money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So when he went in and did the surgery, he's like, I went in, you you were strong enough. I didn't need to use it. So, and my, my breasts are perfect. Like they're literally perfect. Um, and he didn't need to use it. Whereas if I'd gone to someplace else, they were just trying to upsell me. Right. So I didn't need it. Um, so those are the things to be, to have your, you know, your spidey sense up when you're interviewing people and all that kind of stuff. What, what did you do when you um, decided on your surgeon? Uh, same thing. And something that I was looking for too is somebody that did have an understanding of athletes. Yes. Um, so the one that I went with in Florida had um, done most of the breast augmentations for the women in the WWE. So oh, okay. um, building, I mean, they're, they're doing quite a bit in yes. WWE. So um, he was very upfront with me about, you know, recovery times. And he was very specific on telling me kind of the timeline. So I knew what to expect as far as, you know, when I could get back to cardio and training and gave me kind mm -hmm. of that peace of mind of, you know, that way I knew at four weeks out, I knew maybe I could start training at that time. And um, I also, again, I interviewed him and he, he just was the most peaceful for me. And he answered all of my questions and I felt the most connected to him and I felt very yes. confident in him. And, um, I had another previous athlete that recommended him. I got her a breast done from him 10 years prior to that. And her still looked great. She had nothing but great things to say. So recommendation is great. Um, coming in with the athlete perspective, if you are an athlete, because that is our biggest worry when we get surgery is how long am I going to be down for? What does this look like? And kind of the fear of the unknown, I think, is more of the anxiety piece. So if the doctor can tell you straight up off the bat you're not training for 10 to 15 weeks. Yeah. You already know that in the back of your mind. So that kind of lessens that anxiety. The mesh, you know, that's a really great point. While you didn't need the mesh, I didn't get the mesh. And I wish mm -hmm. I did. I ended yeah. up ripping, ripping and now I need to get mine redone. So again, it's person to person, you know, and kind of having that conversation with your, with your doctor. I hear people what? in the sport go over and under. What's your opinion? I hear about mesh or no mesh. What's your opinion? And going right. with the right choice for you. And I think right. the surgeon says, I don't know. I need to get in there and see. Yes. I think that's an, a, that's a fair assessment. It's just Absolutely. like a coach and an athlete. I don't know how long it's going to take for us to get lean. We're just starting together. I don't know your right. body. If a coach is making, you know, these absolute statements and promises and they don't know you from Adam, I feel like that's a little bit difficult. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, just like you said, the doctor that's coming to you with this, this is plan A, if this is what this looks like, this is plan B, if this is what looks like, and they have a specific game plan and they need to get in there and see, I like that approach very well. And then I know no matter what I'm coming out, because if what he saw in there, that's what I got. Absolutely. No, I think that's great too. And in a, again, going back to the honesty thing. So when I went in and got my, my um, breast redone last time, 
while I was in there, Dan, my husband asked questions about gluten plants, right? Asked Dr. Jabs about that because he was like, because, you know, my husband, he's like, the only place you need to grow is your glutes for competing, blah, blah, blah. And Dr. Jabs straight up told him and said, said, no, those are not a good option for her because she does this bodybuilding stuff. And then when you get lean like that, you're going to know that it's a gluten plant. Like, no, that's not a good idea. So, you know, he could have been like, yeah, let's do it and get more money. He straight up said, no, it's not a good idea. So, again, going back to somebody who has, who is honest. You know, yeah. I was going to tell you, tell you the truth. And again, if I was just a normal person, that's, that's one thing, but I'm not, I'm a bodybuilder and that would have screwed up everything that I do. You know what yeah. I mean? So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He, was, he was honest about it. Right. So those, those are, those are things that are, that are important. I think when it comes down to it, somebody who's, who's looking to have a good result versus just trying to milk you for whatever money they can get out of you. Yeah. So I'll try to get you guys that name. And then uh, yeah, I'll, I'll really throw it in there and we can put it up on our stories and stuff like that too. So people can get, can get back to it. So Perfect. Um, cool. Awesome. So um, anything else that you wanted to add for today's topic on the self-sabotage before we close out for today that we didn't, we didn't touch on. So I don't think so. I think we got everything. Awesome. So yeah, so this is gonna be a fun week because uh, you know, like we talked about this last week, we're starting to really get like rolling now, like the clash is going to be the first big show of the year. You're going to be there in person. Do they have a live stream this year? Um, I'm not sure about that. To check is, into that. Does clash have a live stream? He doesn't know either. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll check, check into, into that. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, I always post it. Whatever show I'm at, I always post the live stream if there is one. Yeah. 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 So we'll check in. We'll check into that. I know there's not one for Charlotte. Cause I, I asked about that already. Um, I know there's not one for that one. Um, live streams are hard. They're, they're just, they're expensive. <laughs> They're expensive. Yeah, they are. <laughs> We've talked about this before. We got to we got to support our promoters as best we can. And it's hard to, to just throw up a live stream. It's not it's not as easy. As it's not that simple. Is. Yeah. So, um, but I'll be I'll be checking because I know we've got us we've got supper girls doing that from Fit Body and everything too, and I've got a few a few clients doing it as well. So um, it's gonna be it's gonna we're gonna we're gonna be running pretty quickly going going forward at this point. So yeah. Um, we will come back and do another uh, another podcast uh, next week, but that's why we did this one early because we're going on these on these, uh, and you're getting into prep, so that's there's that too. So let's yes. just add, add everything at once on one. one everything week. at once. This is typical. Very typical. For, <laughs> so I'm comfortable it's here. Li- it's just uh-huh. how life works, you know. So, yep. Yeah, sometimes we work better when we're just going nonstop. I know I do. I, I don't work as well when I've got time on my hands. I'm like, exactly. I gotta find something to do. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, guys. So with that, we will talk, touch base with you guys again at the end of the uh, end of this week. We have some things to talk about with Clash and all that too. So that'll be fun. And uh, we are going to sign out for episode thirty-one. But like, subscribe, comment, ask your questions. We'll come back and we'll answer any questions that you guys have for us this coming week as well. And that's it. So enjoy your week, you guys. We'll be back again next week. Bye.